Hey guys, Captain Calisthenics here with a big channel announcement. My first training program is finally available and it is on a limited time prototype discount. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is the course material is about 80 to 90% done. And once the material is fully finished in about two weeks, then the prototype discount will end and prices are going up permanently. Unless your training is already producing the exact results you want, in which case, that's great, all the power to you, then you need to take a look at the program, which is called the Captain Calisthenics Physique Program. In the 100 plus pages of quality information, to which updates will be added as needed, we cover everything from A to Z as far as training. Sets, reps, volume, intensity, frequency, and anything and everything that you're probably just using guesswork on right now. We also cover nutrition, mental game, and so much more that's going to push you on in your calisthenics journey. At the end of the course, I have included full, detailed, comprehensive programs that you can literally copy-paste and use in your training right now if that's what you want to do. This program comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so that way you have no financial risk and can be fully confident in your decision. If this interests you, then click the first link in the description, because once again, prices will be going up once the prototype period ends in a couple of weeks. And now, with that out of the way, let's proceed to the video. All right, guys, what is happening? It is the captain, the Captain Calisthenics, back for another video after a good four entire months since my last one, which was my plant progression video, if you've not seen that one yet. So this channel is seven, now eight videos strong, but only a couple of those videos have been geared uh, specifically towards training for muscle mass, AKA hypertrophy. It's mostly been a skill so far. Also, let me know what you think of this new video style. I am doing this all in one take, uh, tentatively, that's what I'm gonna try and do. So it is less scripted and than usual, and this is the first time I've actually talked in front of the camera. I usually have done the more professional style where it's a, a voiceover and some different clips. So uh, let me know what you think about this. I can't really objectively view and ascertain my, my own content and the quality of it. So just let me know what you think about this and how it compares to my previous videos. All right, isolation versus compound. The first things we need to cover are the merits and demerits of compound exercises as opposed to isolation exercises, as this question is the main basis for what exercises a person should include in their program. Compound exercises are often assumed to be better. I actually think you're gonna be very hard pressed to find an exercise information source that's advocating for pure isolation exercises for the simple reason that they work multiple muscles simultaneously and are more natural moves. But we need to consider whether these are actually strengths or not. Or to being in shape than the size of your arms. These single joint isolation exercises like curls, side raises, and tricep pushdowns only tend to focus on one muscle group at a time. Large compound movements like squats, deadlifts, and shorter presses, however, hit multiple muscle groups at once, meaning more work in significantly less time. Compound movements also allow you to work with much heavier weights, which is great if you want to build overall strength and muscle. All right, work multiple muscles. Your muscles do not know whether they are working independently or interdependently, okay? They simply do not know. As far as a muscle is concerned, the only question is whether or not it is contracting and how much load it is individually bearing. This is duly determined by the physics of levers as well as the load, either weights or some percentage of one's body weight and for doing calisthenics that is used. The exercises that allow the user to lift the most weight are not superior for this reason, but instead are just less efficient because more weight is required to load up the muscle. One example of this is squats as opposed to leg extensions. You're going to be able to do a lot more weight on a squat, put a lot more weight on the bar than you're going to be able to rack up if you're doing leg extensions. And the reason is leg extensions, they actually isolate your quads quite effectively as opposed to a squat. With a squat, your lower back is being used quite a bit. You're actually straining your spine quite a lot too. It's kind of an issue for compressing your spine. And your glutes are bearing a lot of the load as well. It's just not an anatomically optimal movement if hypertrophy is the person's goal, hypertrophy of the quads in particular. Leg extensions are just a much more efficient way to go about this. When you're doing compound movements, weak points can hold back the other muscles and prevent a user from loading up the real target muscles optimally. Also, moves that require more muscles and more weight for the same muscle load are inevitably more dangerous than their more efficient and natural counterparts. Just because a certain movement pattern might be somewhat common in the real world does not imply that the best way to train the muscles that perform the movement is to try and replicate it with weights or some kind of calisthenics exercise. In fact, when someone trains their muscles with isolation of movements, they will become stronger in the realm of functional strength as well because they're training the same muscles just with different exercises that are a little more natural than the actual movements. So when someone has a primary or sole objective of maximizing their musculature, I would point them to isolation moves over compound moves because they are less likely to cause injuries, require a lot less burden on the joints and ligaments, and allow you to feel the target muscle better among other reasons. 
These considerations don't demand that you eliminate compound exercises, and they certainly don't imply that you can't build muscle with them, but they do suggest that a program that is based on isolation exercises is a lot more optimal for someone who simply wants to build muscle in the safest and most efficient way possible. And a fantastic resource I'd like to point you to that's gonna cover the biomechanics of exercise, gonna cover which exercises are most natural, safest, most efficient for hypertrophy purposes is Physics of Exercise Resistance by Doug Brignoli. Really interesting, one of the few people that's actually putting out new content, he's not just regurgitating other stuff in the fitness sphere. Definitely recommend giving him a, a look if you wanna find some actual useful information on exercise selection. For body weight bodybuilding and physique training in general, we want to be using exercises that efficiently and safely load up the target muscle that can be scaled in difficulty to a great extent so they're not too easy or too hard and that are reasonably easy to obtain a setup for. The exercises in my body weight size program, they are selected according to this criterion and without revealing all the value in this course, I'm gonna show a couple examples of what I'm talking about. Deltoid has three heads, and while my bodyweight science program has fantastic methods for growing all of them, we will focus here solely on the middle head. Whoa, middle head. Voice being weird. All, almost all of the videos on calisthenic shoulder training will tell you to do some version of handstand push-up progressions. However, overhead pressing movements, they pose a somewhat high risk of injury, and they strain the rotator cuffs, and they're far from the natural anatomical motion of the front and middle deltoids. The best movement for the middle delt, according to the threefold criterion established earlier, is the side raise movement. However, while this is easy with weight training equipment, how can this be used for the body weight athlete? Okay, how are you gonna how are we gonna implement this information? The way you adapt this exercise to calisthenics, and I have never actually seen this exact exercise used in this way on YouTube. It might actually be original. So let me know in the comments if you've seen it. It's what I call the body weight side raise. To perform this move, you will place your rings roughly at a height, such as the bottom of the ring is at the, the height of the top of your kneecap. You're gonna scoot back, the amount depends on how strong you are, the further you are back, the easier it is. And then with your elbow pits facing up and not forwards, and this is key, use your middle deltoids to pull yourself forward by pulling the rings outward until they are in line with your body. The genius of this exercise is that it is mostly an isolation movement, and it has an optimal resistance curve, a low risk for injury, and easy scalability. If you focus on using your shoulders to pull yourself, then you will actually engage your middle trapezius and back muscles very minimally. So it's basically an isolation movement, which is what we want. As far as resistance curve goes, the exercise requires the most force when the muscle is strongest, which is the beginning of the rep, and the least force when it is weakest, which is at the end of the rep, which is also optimal. Neither your spine nor any joints are especially stressed during the move, and the exercise is also easily scalable, as we already said. Now, two notes I would like to make here. First, some of you may have seen this promoted as a rear delt exercise before and are wondering why I am claiming it targets the middle delt instead. The reason for this is that when the movement is performed with the elbow pits facing forward and not up, the rear delt will be targeted more than the middle delt. However, for your rear delt training, you do want to have your arms far below the shoulder line so you can engage your rear delts as well as possible. So in other words, it depends on the, the twisting of the arm. Well, the intended function of the middle deltoid is lateral abduction, manipulating the direction of movement by starting with your arms out straight in front of you and then pulling back until your arm is straight out next to you with your elbow pit facing upward. That is the exact same muscle movement, just with a different starting and ending point. The resistance that's applied is the exact same. In both cases, the middle deltoid is parallel to resistance at the beginning of the movement and per perpendicular to it at the end, and the muscle contracts in the exact same way. One other freebie I will give you is a couple different exercises for glutes. And the reason for this is my original calisthenics training, uh, my leg training tutorial, it actually lacked any exercises directly for the glutes. So let's go ahead and cover those now. The reason you do not want weak glutes, a few reasons actually, is that it will affect your posture, it can cause knee stability issues, and it will hurt your performance in other leg movements among other reasons. All right, I'm not gonna go ahead and explain these perfectly, but I'm gonna go ahead and put some text on the screen that explains why these exercises are a lot better than the ones that you have usually seen on YouTube.
All right, so sets, reps, volume, and frequency can't be singled out and considered in a vacuum because they are all related to each other. Ultimately, sets and reps are positively correlated with overall volume, and volume is correlated inversely with frequency. What does this mean? This means that if you are training a muscle only once a week, you need to absolutely destroy that muscle if you're gonna cause a stimulus for growth. But if you are training it every day, you would need to train the muscle with less volume so that you could recover for your session the following day. The mainstream fitness information sources, they're gonna tell you that low reps such as one to five will build almost entirely strength, that a medium rep range will build almost entirely muscle, and that a higher rep range, 15 or more, will primarily train your muscular endurance and not actually build muscle or strength at all. Now, I already debunked this nonsense in my video on arms training, and while my intuitive explanation of why the rep range fallacies were bogus made sense to a lot of people, I would like to elaborate a little bit on the matter here. One of the most retarded things I've ever heard people suggest about training is that you should train in low reps for strength and high reps for muscle, and somehow that low reps will not build muscle at all. In my experience, doing high reps of easy exercises builds neither strength nor muscle, while low reps builds both. How can someone expect easy exercises to get results and hard exercises not to? This is just illogical. Power lifters are very muscular, which you can see quite clearly whenever they cut weight, and they lift in one to three rep sets entirely. Imagining that they would be more muscular if they just did sets of 12 or 15 or something is just ridiculous. In other words, do low rep sets of the hard... Muscle load is the factor that matters most. When you bring a muscle close to failure over and over during a workout, you are creating a strong stimulus for growth. And no, time under tension is not the end all be all when it comes to hypertrophy. If time under tension is the most important factor, why not just do one pound weights and just do like hundreds of reps of bicep curls or some other exercise? This will take forever, it'll strain your nervous system ridiculously, and it'll require a lot of deloads because you're gonna be burning out so often and it also won't build much strength. In other words, why would you do this? You can curl a one pound weight and it may take 100 reps before you get close to failure. You can also curl a heavier weight and be closer to failure by rep seven. In other words, you can reach maximum muscle recruitment much earlier if you're using a heavier weight. So time under tension, no, it's not the end all be all. It's about using the muscle maximally and achieving maximal recruitment going close to failure. The formula for muscle growth as far as sets and reps goes is not a one-dimensional approach and it boils down to this, bringing a muscle close enough to failure enough times week over week, that's it. Lower reps allow you to do this faster. If you were curling a 20 pound weight and that is pretty hard for you, you can do about seven reps with good form, then doing several sets of five reps until you eventually fail on the fifth rep is an easier way to provide stimulus for growth than doing a low weight for a ton of reps. Additionally, when you consider how muscle burn often causes you to stop short of total muscle failure, how it taxes your nervous system, how it makes workouts kind of miserable, it is not the drive of, uh, of muscle growth, muscle burn is, training with high reps just doesn't make very much sense to me. When you are training with lower to medium reps, you are most efficient and you can build muscle and strength the easiest. You can also drastically improve your muscular endurance like the high rep guys claim that their method does if you are doing lower reps. When you are training at a low weight with high reps, even if you do manage to build a similar amount of muscle to someone training with uh, lower reps, you will still not be as strong. Now, as far as frequency and splits, one common frequency among old school bodybuilders is a frequency that I believe works pretty well, which is training each muscle twice per week with high volume and high intensity. It is difficult to train a muscle three times or more per week because of how jam-packed and lengthy the workouts would have to be. If you do that all week and then you have uh, one rest day, you're gonna be doing six sets, let's just say six sets per chest, middle deltoids, rear deltoids, front deltoids, last, middle trapezius, biceps, tricep, you get the idea. That's already 60 sets just for your upper body day and that excludes abs. And once again, that's only if you're doing six sets per body part. So it's kind of ridiculous to train uh, three times or more per week each muscle, in my opinion, if you're really trying to build each muscle as well as possible. That's why I think two times a week is a, is a decent compromise. I found the following split to work fairly well for hypertrophy training because it, it spreads the workload fairly evenly among the three days and it's centered around kind of training opposite muscle groups on most days, which is a nice feel. So go ahead and give this a look. I think it works pretty well. That's what I'm using right now. Scalability. With calisthenics, you have to deal with an issue that is hardly even a factor with weight training and that is the ease with which you can scale the difficulty of an exercise up or down. Some of the exercises that I advocate for, the difficulty is based on your foot placement and ring height. And it's a lot harder to track these things than it is to track the numbers on uh, some dumbbells or something like that. 
I cover exactly how you can measurably track your difficulty on most calisthenics exercises in my full program, as this is something that you'll have to figure out in order to optimize your calisthenics hypertrophy training efforts. All right, so other factors, diet, sleep, stretching, hormones, etc. Diet. Perhaps I will release a standalone video on diet eventually, but for gaining muscle, you will obviously need to be in a substantial caloric surplus, and you should aim for one gram per uh, protein per pound of body weight as a rule of thumb. If you are skinny, you can add an extra 20 grams of protein to this number. Consuming extreme amounts of protein, like two or three grams per pound of body weight, won't help you gain more muscle. It'll actually just stretch, stress your digestive system uh, unnecessarily. So don't do this. You don't need to cause organ issues. As for how healthy you eat, yes, you will most likely feel best, function best, and look best both facially and physically if you are eating clean, but do your own research and figure out for yourself what you want to do. Now, this is for bulking, okay? If you are fat, then you need to eat in a caloric deficit, and I would recommend actually eating clean, okay? I think it's a little more clear-cut in that situation if you are trying to go down in your weight. Now, people always talk about the calories in and calories out thing, and while this is true, if you are fat, then I would recommend eating clean because the benefits to your metabolism as well as various biomarkers and physiological processes will probably actually speed up your loss of weight. Now, technically, these factors do play into calories in, calories out, because if you're eating a lot of dirty foods, then maybe you'll need to eat a slightly bigger deficit in order to compensate for the damage to your metabolism or something like that. Eating a little bit of a surplus or a little bit of a deficit, depending on your goals. And if you are fat, go ahead and eat clean because you need to get not fat, okay? If you're fat, you need to get not fat. That's kind of the first thing you need to do if you wanna be progressing in calisthenics. And just be healthy, you know? come on. I don't know a lot about fasting and losing weight quick schemes, and I'm not gonna do a bunch of research about that for this video. So go ahead and do your own research, but stay safe, don't be ridiculous, okay? Radical diets like keto, they are not healthy. If you want to look into other diets, and there are so many of them, then you can, but the only reason any of them will work is because you are in a caloric deficit, okay? Sleep. If you thought this section on diet and nutrition was a little bit brief and basic, just wait till you hear how little I have on sleep, okay? Pretty straightforward, nothing crazy, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. You will probably make the fastest progress if you are sleeping at least 7.5 hours per night. If you have poor sleep, you may want to see a professional about it if possible. Take melatonin to fall asleep if needed and just do your own research here, okay? That's it, just do it. Just don't, don't not do it, just do it, just sleep. It shouldn't be that hard. Stretching, for the best recovery and thus for the best performance the following day, and the best uh, cumulative gains over time, stretching each night is highly recommended. I have not made a full video on warming up or stretching, but make sure not to neglect either of those areas. If you struggle with any joint issues or bicep, tricep tightness, make sure and watch this video of mine. I actually have pretty good strategies for getting rid of that arm tightness. I used to have that as a pretty big issue I had to deal with. Hormones. If you have a lot of fatigue or depression, even though your lifestyle factors are pretty well optimized, consider getting a full blood panel since certain hormonal deficiencies can impact your training progress to a decent extent. Low testosterone is probably the most recognized hormonal hindrance in this context, but you want to make sure nothing is really off in your endocrine system. Once again, this is really more relevant for those with fatigue issues and such things like that, but depression or family history maybe of testosterone deficiencies or hormone problems, but it is something you do want to consider and you want to make sure you have buckled up so you can progress as fast as possible. Thank you guys for watching. I have more content coming up on the docket. I apologize, it's been so long since I put out a video. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, if you have any video recommendations, any feedback on how this talking to the camera style went as opposed to my the style I had in my last videos. That's all I have for you guys. That's it, I'm done talking. Y'all have a great rest of your day. Captain Calisthenics out. Whoa.